Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks to Daryl and the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to present here today. My name is Ken Harris, and I'm with the Natural Research Council, National Institute for Nanotechnology. And this morning, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to some of the work our group is doing on exotonic solar cells. So, I'm actually here today representing a fairly sizable group of people, and that is because the NINT Solar Energy Collaboration is staffed from two distinct groups at NINT. On the left, we have the Materials and Interfacial Chemistry Group. This is led by Dr. Jillian Buriak. Uh, Jillian is an NRC employee, but she is also a professor of chemistry. So her group is primarily composed of chemists. I am with this group, I'm here. Uh, we have one other NRC employee, that's Jen Bruce, a technician. But the rest of that team is made up of postdocs and graduate students. The other half of our collaboration is the Applied Materials for Energy group. Uh, this is led by Dr. Mike Brett. Uh, you've heard his name a few times already this morning. He is an NRC employee, uh, but he is also a professor of electrical engineering. Uh, so his group is primarily composed of engineers. One other NRC employee, Mike Fleischauer in the back, uh, and the rest of his team is grad students and postdocs. Now, the, not every one of these, these people in the, these images is uh, a part of the NIT Solar Energy Collaboration. Distinct subsets of each of these groups combine to form the solar energy team. Uh, I'm not going to name everybody here, uh, but the focus of these people is to perform research rather than development. I didn't, we're not allowed to sell products, so we aim to recoup our costs by licensing intellectual property. Uh, but what I mentioned is that our team is focused on solar energy. Now, why would somebody want to do that kind of research? And a very large part of our motivation comes from all of these reports that are continuously being generated describing the future energy needs of our civilization. One report tells us that by 2050, we're going to require five times as much energy as we did in 1995. And these are absolutely staggering quantities of energy. But currently, photovoltaics only account for a very small portion of that. One report says 0.01% of energy is generated by photovoltaics. But this is not for a lack of potential. And you see on the right, I have a, a chart generated by Natural, Natural Resources Canada uh, listing the annual potential for photovoltaics against a list of cities. Uh, the units, a little bit unusual, is the amount of energy generated in a typical year uh, by a, a typical one kilowatt peak solar cell. The, uh, the generally sunny places like Cairo, Mexico City, obviously have a very large potential for PV. But places like Regina aren't so shabby either. Calgary, Winnipeg, Edmonton all have very respectable potentials for photovoltaics. Now, even at the lower end of the scale, places like Japan or Germany, where uh, they have much more modest potentials for PV, many of, uh, of these type of, of, uh, of countries have already, uh, have already put forward very large uh, quantities of money in order to uh, advance solar energy technologies. And uh, the the technology that we are investigating in order to uh, attack this problem is the Generation 3 exotonic solar cells. And I'll give you a very brief introduction to how this type of cell works. Now, a normal exotonic solar cell has four basic components. First thing is a transparent electrode. Light comes into the cell, and it's supposed to go directly through that electrode. The other end, we have a much more familiar electrode, something like aluminum, gold, silver. Any light that gets all the way to the bottom of the cell is simply reflected from that electrode back into the active layer, and you have another chance at absorbing that energy. The other two components of that cell are at the active region of the cell. We have one material in pink here. It's called the hole transport layer, or the electron donor. And the other one in blue is our electron transport layer, or electron acceptor. Light comes into the cell. Like I mentioned it passes directly through the transparent electrode, and it is absorbed here in the pink region. What happens when, that, uh, when light is absorbed is that an electron that's normally in the ground state is promoted from a low energy state to a higher energy state. Once that's happened, the electron is free to bounce around a little bit. It diffuses. But another thing that happens is that during that promotion, there's a hole left behind. That hole has a positive charge, and it is also free to bounce around. But the electron and the hole move together. That collective electron hole pair is called an exciton, and that's where the name exotonic solar cell comes from. So, 
An exciton can diffuse, and if on its travels that exciton encounters an interface between a hole and transport layer, a uh, hole and electron transport layer, the electron can bounce across into the electron transport layer and the hole stays behind. The hole is then transported out of the cell, electron is transported out of the cell, that makes up an electrical current, and that is how you generate electrical energy based on uh, the input of solar energy. Now in our group we're attempting to make solution processable solar cells, so the materials that we are investigating include soluble conducting polymers, soluble semiconducting and metallic nanoparticles, and the range of fullerenes like carbon nanotubes. That is the basics of how an excitonic solar cell works, uh, but in order to achieve the best possible performance, we have a number of parameters that must be optimized. First thing is we want the transparent electrode to be as transparent as possible. We don't want any sunlight absorbed there. We want it all to be absorbed in the actual active layer of the device. Once we get to the active layer, we want every, uh, every, uh, every bit of energy to be absorbed there. We want to create as many excitons as possible. Uh, once we've done that, we want every exciton to be separated, so we have to maximize the amount of interfacial area between those two materials. Once that's been done, we want all of the uh, electrons and holes to be transported out of the device, so there should be no trapped spaces. We don't want to keep, uh, we don't want to have any charge carriers left behind. Uh, finally, it's sometimes very difficult to get electrons or holes to hop across from the transport material into the electrode. There's an energy barrier that is often present there, and if that energy barrier is present, uh, that limits the amount of charge that we can extract. <coughs> so, so lucky enough, we have a fairly large group of people involved in this research, and that uh, allows us to take a very multifaceted approach to this problem. We're looking at a wide variety of different things simultaneously. I, I'm not going to have time to go through all of these in detail, but we will be investing in a range of new photoactive materials, hoping to achieve better light absorption and better charge transport. You've already had a preview of this one. Glancing angle deposition is a technique used to create columnar structures. Uh, and this is also very favorable for, uh, for exotonic solar cells. We are investigating a technique called layer by layer deposition. And this is very favorable with water soluble materials. Uh, another, another link up with the clean tech. And finally, we do a lot of our work with inorganic nanoparticles. We're at the National Institute for Nanotechnology, and so they're very happy with us when we do nano research. <coughs>